And what that causes you to do is filter out all the positive or even neutral aspects of a situation and instead give a lot of credit only to the things that support the negative way that you already feel about yourself. Hey everybody, before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 264. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people just like you. And today I have a question and answer episode, as usual, two really good questions. Um, you know, first one's a little bit longer, not, not super, super long, um, and it does involve some discussion of self-harm. Nothing graphic, but I want to let you know about that. And second one is uh, very short and sweet, but hopefully I can give a good answer to it. Today, I feel um, simultaneously happy and also like the biggest idiot ever. <laughs> I don't know if you guys ever do this, but um, I do this all the time. Maybe it comes from just like background or whatever, but I often do this thing where for some reason in my mind, something is very like unattainable, especially if it's something like a product that I would like to buy, something that would be a convenience something that I want for myself. And for some reason in my mind, I was like, oh, I, I just, you know, that that's just going to have to be inconvenient. I can't get that. It costs too much, whatever. And in this case, the thing I'm talking about is a fucking air conditioner. <laughs> so in my house, I've, I'm doing, you know, primarily online, well, all online therapy right now. Um, I go into the office to do the testing that I do, but for therapy, it's all online. And it's actually been that way since uh, before COVID. I transitioned to doing primarily online uh, therapy before that. And the uh, home office that I have does not have an air conditioner. And I live in, um, you know, uh, Ojai, California, if you know where that is, Southern California. Um, and it gets hot as balls here, man. Like, you know, it's routinely, you know, 97 when I'm working or something like that. And this room has two, uh, you know, pretty sizable windows right by the desk. And so it becomes like a greenhouse. And so on certain days, like Tuesdays, I have you know, five back-to-back -back therapy sessions. And I'm just like sweating my ass off in here. No amount of fans can make it tolerable. And for some reason, I just, you know, I'm like, oh, well, I wish I could have AC in here, but I guess I can't. And then I'm like, you know what? This is, this is stupid. Let me go look. And I go on Amazon. It's like 150 bucks to get a wall unit AC. And so I just bought one. Two days later, it was shipped. And now it's in my window. And like life is a lot better. So I don't know why I never did that before. For some reason, I had this impression that like just AC units were like really expensive. Uh, they're really not. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's there's different ranges of of price that people are comfortable with. But for me, you know, dropping you know a hundred or two hundred dollars on something that's a you know literally going to make my life a whole lot better while I'm working is totally acceptable. And so now I just feel dumb in retrospect for not having done that before. I don't know if you guys ever do that. I talked to a few people about it and everybody had their own example of it, but that one is certainly mine for right now. But that's great because uh, now I can be a little bit more comfortable even tonight. I mean, it's it's uh, about 930 and it's almost 80 degrees out still uh, where I live. And so I, you know, set the room to cool down a bit before I came in here. The one thing a lot of people don't realize about like podcasting or doing YouTube videos, different content that involves audio is that you often have to turn everything off, you know, fans, air conditioners, things like that. So it can be pretty darn hot in here when I'm recording these. So at least I can cool it down and get things a little more comfortable before, you know, jumping on and recording this for you. So that's my life ramble <laughs> for right now. Uh, if you have done anything similar and you feel embarrassed by it, you can feel a little bit less embarrassed knowing that I'm in that boat with you. But yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, as I said, two really good questions. And here's the first one. 
Okay, so uh, first question reads, Dear Robert, I have a mental health question. So I'm 34, married with two small kids, a job, and in a few months, a PhD. I have a history of self-harm due to having very strict and controlling parents and a lot of drama in my teenage years. I self-harmed a ton, oh sorry, I self-harmed on and off for 10 years, but stopped after I managed to distance myself from my primary family after leaving for university. I never had professional help or therapy, but I kind of managed to fix myself a bit, if you know what I mean. My life now is okay in general, obviously stressful, occasionally kids, doctorate, etc., but okay. My question is this, I sometimes feel all my resolved past is lurking somewhere in the background. The fact that all these issues were never properly addressed really worries me sometimes. I tend to crack under pressure occasionally when I'm really stressed out, and I seek ways to harm myself without leaving marks. Cutting is not an option for me anymore because of kids and husband, and I feel the weight of having fewer options. Harming myself calms me down and gives me a sense of control, but all the secretiveness is really bothering me. I thought I was done with self-harm when I stopped cutting 12 years ago. Is therapy still an option after all this time? Thank you, and I look forward to maybe hearing your answer to my question on your podcast. Okay, so really good question. Thank you for that, and definitely very proud of you for all the progress that you've made. It sounds like you've been able to you know, really build a good life for yourself and overcome a lot of challenges. And what you're talking about here is kind of a somewhat common scenario uh, for people that have a history of self-harm for these things to become, you know, less intense, uh, less overt over time, you know, not doing as obvious of self-harm methods, but for it to still linger in some way. And then definitely it rears its head when you're under significant pressure. It's sort of an old standby, right? The self-harm is an old coping strategy that has gotten you through a lot. And maybe at a certain point, even though we would like to avoid it as much as possible, it served a purpose for you and it really helped you out. And so it's something that you have, um, you know, kind of a well-worn groove in your brain for. And so when you come to situations that are really stressful for you, that are um, really difficult, then it pops up again. And at least whether you're engaging in, you know, cutting itself or not, you have this urge to self-harm. You have this urge to calm you down, to ground yourself in that sort of way. Um, But you're trying to avoid that. You don't want to do that. Um, But a lot of people over time who used to maybe cut might move from that to over-exercising, you know, excessively, uh, to scratching themselves, burning themselves, uh, slapping themselves with different objects or, um, you know, giving themselves burns, things like that. There's, There's lots of different potential ways that somebody might harm themselves in a similar vein. But um, yeah, it's, it's pretty common for people to transition to different forms of this as they are less able to sort of get away with cutting or more overt things like I talked about. Um, you know, in general, the way that I see psychiatric issues is that there are layers to them and you kind of work your way from the top down, though certainly you could bounce all over the place. But in general, you know, the way that I see things is you have sort of the top level, which are the symptoms, you know, uh, oftentimes I refer to it as sort of like the emotional bleeding, you're having a really hard time, maybe you're in crisis, you know, your situation is bad, and you need to do some things to just cope with that, to learn how to stop that emotional bleeding and how to just, you know, live enough of a life to be okay. Um, And then once you sort of get through that top level stuff and and really the overt symptoms that you need to immediately deal with, then below that you have things like uh, lifestyle factors, habits, ways of life, um, all of those sorts of things. And below that, down toward the bottom, you have what are the underlying reasons? What are the what are the things that happened or the things that you learned early on that caused these issues to emerge in the first place, Um, whether it's has to do with your family things you've been through. Um, Obviously, there are going to be many influences from the micro scale of like your family or yourself to the macro scale of things like society in general. Um, But then, you know, you get down to that sort of bedrock and you start looking at, okay, where did these things come from in the first place? And I think that you've done a really good job figuring out a lot of that outer layer stuff on your own. And I have to imagine that your your sort of drive to succeed and move forward in your life has allowed you to to do that, to not get so bogged down by the past and maybe the symptoms that pop up that you used to struggle with. You know, you've been able to kind of push your way through those, look forward, succeed and make things happen for yourself. But at a certain point, that little voice in the back of your head starts to creep in and it reminds you that there's a reason all of this started in the first place. 
and that there are issues under the surface that remain unresolved. And I can see that you're kind of feeling the pressure of that now. And I understand the farther down that line you go, the farther you go without really, really addressing the, the underlying issues and the root of it all, it can start to seem more threatening right? Like it's, I often talk about a house of cards, like you've built up this house of cards over time. You know, one card is your family, one's your career, one's your academic career, you know, all these different things. And you place each card very carefully and keep it going for so many years that it feels like if you kind of open up this box, it would be like pulling out one of the cards on that, on the, on the bottom row. And suddenly everything comes tumbling down. So it can feel very, very scary. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. Okay, this episode is brought to you by Felix Gray. Uh, hopefully now that it's you know summertime, you guys are working a little bit less on the computer, getting outside more, doing stuff like that. But I know that's that's wishful thinking and a lot of us are mainly stuck behind a computer or just on our phones all the time using all those screens. And so, you know, with those times, uh, maybe you want to think about getting some blue light glasses. Uh, five years ago, Felix Gray realized that our eyes weren't really meant to look at screens all day. And they designed glasses to make daily screen time more comfortable and your workday more productive. Uh, Felix Gray has lenses that filter 15 times more of the important blue light than other types. And uh, they have really nice frames. I have the Nash. So if you go to their website and look up the the Nash frames, they're probably the first ones on the search list in black. I post pictures of them all the time on my Instagram. I, I pretty much wear them almost every night because I spend time, you know, writing reports, doing the podcast, things like that. And I never used blue light glasses before, but I find myself reaching for them and sort of craving them now when I'm spending a lot of time on the computer because I can tell a difference in just how much it affects me. Uh, it's a little bit hard to describe the difference um, in terms of what it feels like. Uh, I can definitely tell more fatigue when I'm not using them, uh, more eye fatigue that is, not really physical fatigue. I think that I probably sleep a little bit better when I remember to use the blue light glasses as well. And um, it just seems to be less straining. And so I feel more comfortable wearing them. So usually when I'm settling in for the night to, to get sort of my night shift done, I've been reaching for the Felix Gray glasses and I'm, I'm really enjoying them. And every time I walk around the house and forget to take them off, my wife always says I look cute with them on. So uh, the style is good. Um, so yeah, they're, they're frames that are made from acetate and they're hand finished. So they're durable, lightweight and comfortable and stylish. So if you want to check them out, uh, they have non-prescription and prescription lenses available. Go to felixgrayglasses.com and that's, uh, F E L I X G R A Y felixgrayglasses.com slash duff. You have free shipping, free returns, and free exchanges at felixgrayglasses.com slash duff. All right, back to the show. So with all of that, I think that the most important thing to consider here is that this does seem to be legitimately impacting you. And you also have not fully stopped self-harming. You know, I want you to be honest with yourself about that. You've adapted it. You've decreased how intense it is. You've made it in, in a form that's probably more sort of socially acceptable or more easily hidden. You talked about the secrecy and things like that. Um, but the urge is definitely still there. And so that that pattern of wanting some sort of release or wanting some sort of physical method of grounding yourself is still there. And so I think it's totally worth paying attention to because uh, you're you're moving into another phase of your life as you get your doctorate here. And, uh, you know, there's no better time to invest in yourself and make sure that you're you're playing the long game. So to your question about whether therapy is still an option, absolutely. I definitely think that it is. There's no timeline on therapy, guys. Like whether it's this situation or let's say you have, you know, a traumatic experience as a child and you never got therapy for it. And now you find yourself in your 60s really dwelling on it and having a hard time with what this means for your identity, then go to therapy for it. Like absolutely. There's there's no timeline on it and it still remains a good idea. Um, so for you, yes, definitely. Uh, therapy is an option and I would suggest it. You know, like I said before, it's a scary prospect for a lot of people, but you have to remember that in a lot of ways, you're actually even more well-equipped right now to deal with this than you were before. You've gained a lot of things. You know, you found a lot of your own ways of coping that don't involve self-harm. You've pushed through a lot of life. You've learned a lot of lessons. You've built resilience. You're wiser and more intelligent now. And that's not all just going to suddenly disappear because you start digging into this. And when it comes to working with a therapist, potentially, um, you know, finding an expert to talk about it, 
that might benefit you even more now because you have all that wisdom you're bringing along with you in that experience. So it may be a uniquely good opportunity rather than just like acceptable. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think that simply finding an expert that you can talk to, um, you know, be that a psychologist or, you know, a therapist, uh, somebody that you can talk to, shoot, I mean, at this point, really anybody, therapy is a great option, but if you have a, a shaman or a priest or an advisor, uh, anybody that you feel like would be a good person to hold this information for you and counsel you on it, it's a great idea. Um, even just finding somebody and being fully honest with them can be a huge step. Because I have to imagine there aren't a lot of people in your life that that know about this. And among those that do, I wonder if you even tell any of them the whole truth, the full truth, right? Even yourself, you know, sometimes we don't tell the full truth to ourselves either. So um, I think that you need somebody who you can tell the full entire truth to and for somebody that can keep you accountable. Uh, friends, family don't often have the ability to serve that role because there's a lot tied up into their, they play multiple roles for you. You know, they're your friend, they're your family member. They love you. They have, um, an attachment to you. They don't want to see you upset. So there's, there's things that complicate their ability to help you. I talked about this in the last episode about how, you know, therapists can't really fix their family members for the same reason. Like it, it's more complicated when you bring in the family element of it. So having somebody external that you can be fully honest with without feeling like there's a big risk there, someone that can keep you accountable, um, those are uh, huge things. I, I say this a lot, but um, issues like this have a harder time existing when they're dragged out into the light. They want to live in the darkness. They want to be secret. They want to be your special thing that you hold on to and don't tell anybody about, but you think about when you're all alone. Don't let that happen. You know, drag it out into the light. Tell somebody about it. And simply just stating your intention with a professional saying, I want to work on this. This is what I've been through. This is what still happens. And allowing them in, allowing them the opportunity to try and help you, that in itself can make a massive difference regardless of the particular therapy techniques that are used. Uh, just having that out there is a big part of it. And you did mention you've never had therapy in the past, which, you know, on one hand, that's, that's, it's awesome that you were able to make uh, so much progress without that. But on the other hand, I wonder, you know, what are your attitudes toward therapy? Do you have um, some negative feelings about it, whether they're, you know, uh, right out there in the open or it's more sort of the subconscious stuff? Because uh, I think a lot of people feel bad for considering therapy. They, they, they feel like it's a failure on their part, like they weren't able to do it on their own. So now they have to go get some therapy for it. And I really do not see it that way. Uh, I've said this before, but professional help is self-help. To me, it's just like medication or a gym membership. It's about you recognizing the resources that are at your disposal, what you have access to, and then you have to make the choice to use them. And in a lot of ways, it's less stubborn, right? A lot of people will be like, oh, no, I can do it on my own and act like this isn't part of doing it on your own. And that stubbornness doesn't help. Instead, you know, recognizing, hey, uh, why would I not use this resource if I have it available to me? I can give it a try and see how it goes. So I think it's a really responsible thing to do. And I think there's a lot of courage in facing something that you've been really afraid to face head on for quite a while now. So all this is to say, I think you're really on the right track here. I think that it's it's worthy to pay attention to it, especially right now. I think that you have the strength to approach this and it's at a good transitional point in your life. So you know, reach out, take things at your own pace. If you do start talking to somebody, you don't have to rush into everything all at once. You don't have to change everything all at once. That can be very scary too. This is something that even though you maybe have mixed feelings about it, uh, this coping strategy of self-harm has belonged to you for a long time. And when somebody gets in there and starts poking and prodding at it and suggesting different ways to do things, it's easy to feel defensive about that. It's easy to feel unsafe. And so you can move at your own pace. You don't have to change and remove everything all at once. But um, there are a lot of different great therapists out there that could potentially be a really good match for you. So I feel optimistic about where you're at. And I really think that you can make some changes for yourself here. So thank you for writing in and really good question. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. And the Hardcore Health Help Podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash duff. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention in this read is that 
therapy isn't just a once and done sort of thing for a lot of people. Uh, throughout the years, like it makes sense to go back to therapy to have a little bit of a re-up on your skills that you've learned in therapy before. Or if you're just going through a hard time, you need a little bit of extra support. There's nothing wrong with doing therapy again, even if it's for just sort of a brief time limited period. So if you're in that boat where maybe you could use a tune up or you're going through a period of time where you would like a little extra support, maybe consider doing something like BetterHelp. Uh, BetterHelp is an online therapy platform. They assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating very quickly, usually under 48 hours. Not a crisis line or self-help, professional counseling done securely online. Within the uh, BetterHelp network, they have a broad range of expertise. So if you don't have people in your area that can serve your needs, you very well may find somebody in BetterHelp who can. And the service is available to clients worldwide. You log into your account at any time and you can send a message to your counselor. You'll get a timely and thoughtful response back. Plus, you can also schedule weekly video or phone sessions. If you have a match that just doesn't fit the bill, uh, BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so you can change free and easily if you need to. Uh, and it is often more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and they have financial aid available if you qualify. So BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. If you check out their website and like what you see, visit betterhelp.com duff, and that's better H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Betterhelp.com slash duff. All right, back to the show. Okay, and on to question two, very short one, just reads, Hi, I was wondering if you could discuss my question on your next podcast. Here it is. My depression has been worsening and the hopelessness is sucking me in deeper. How can I start to counteract this feeling and find joy in the little things again? So that's it. Uh, really good question. And I feel like it's maybe been a while since I've uh, had opportunity just to talk about sort of the the bread and butter of, of working with depression and, and how to sort of clamor out of that hole. So let's do it. Let's talk about some of the depression basics. Um, first off, similar to, similarly to the last question, if you're going through this alone, don't. Share it with other people. Um, start with one person, even if it's just a friend or family member, somebody that you trust at work, anything like that, your doctor, you know, your medical doctor, anybody. I would advise you to at least share this with one person so that you can, again, drag it out into the light. Don't let it be this this dirty little secret that you have and let it kind of fester and become its own thing. Um, you you want to make sure that there's some accountability here, that it's not just this secret that you get to keep, that this is something that's in the, not in the open for everybody to see, but it's not a total secret so that it's something that can be a target for you to make a difference in. So don't go it alone. Um, the next thing I'd, I'd say is that you'll probably want to check in on your basics, you know, your kind of physiological basics. These are often some of the first things to go when you're really depressed. Um, and like many things in depression, it's kind of paradoxical where, you know, doing the things that you've stopped doing is going to help you feel less depressed, but you stop doing them because you're depressed, right? So it's like hard. It's like, okay, well, just do the things that you stopped doing because you're depressed. Um, so I understand that, um, and, but it, it, it still stands that these are helpful things to do. So we want to try to find some way to get back to it. And I would suggest maybe just starting with one or two things um, to get started. You don't have to do everything all at once, but if there's one thing you could find yourself to do, start with that and then build to two and then kind of go from there. So I'm talking about things like uh, sunshine. You know, if you have the ability to get outside of your house during the day, Spend a, a bit of time in the sun. Uh, allow yourself to, you know, um, see the sun come up or the sun go down. Just get some sunlight exposure because that actually does have a legitimate effect on your mood as well as your sort of day-night cycle, that circadian rhythm that, that governs your sleep. On the sleep side of things, you know, trying to get your sleep under control is also something that can be very, very helpful. Depression can have the symptom of dysregulating your sleep. You can either have, you know, hypersomnia um, where you're sleeping too much or insomnia where you can't fall asleep. You can have trouble with sleep maintenance where you're waking up a lot during the night. And so you can get really physiologically out of whack. Sleep is, is seriously important. It's really important, um, not just for rest itself, but there's also a lot of rejuvenating processes that happen during sleep. And if you don't 
um, get those, it can make you feel off kilter. It can make you feel lethargic. It can make you feel sad and it can also mess with your memory. So getting your sleep under control, you know, falling asleep, trying to start falling asleep at a reasonable hour, getting up at a good time, having some consistency there, not just whenever you fall asleep and whenever you wake up, those things can be very beneficial. And again, you know, getting some sunlight during the day can help with that because, you know, if you're, if you're outside, for instance, in the, in the later afternoon and evening time, when it starts to get dark, that's going to trigger your body to start producing melatonin, which will help you to get more sleepy um, for when it's time to actually go to bed. So, you know, those things, um, exercising, that's one that you probably have already heard is helpful for depression and it legitimately is. I know it can feel like the the hardest thing in the world, or it's just so typical to give that advice, but you know, the research says, you know, um, exercising moderately, you know, several times a week has a similar effect to taking an antidepressant medication. And it's one you can do while taking an antidepressant medication. So you can get a double whammy there. Um, But it's something that can absolutely legitimately help your mood out. And then food, you know, like I said, these are all the basics we're talking about. Food, making sure you're just not eating like a total garbage human and getting some, you know, adequate nutrition, um, you know, uh, some semblance of balance to your diet, making sure that you don't have like severe vitamin deficiencies because you can feel depressed or have um, all sorts of different issues simply because you're not getting enough of, of particular vitamins. So, you know, maybe even getting to the doctor, having them do so, some lab work, you know, make sure that you're um, not showing any vitamin deficiencies, making sure you're not, not like hypothyroidic, your thyroid hormone isn't high enough so that that's making you feel depressed. Um, you know, Occam's razor, that, that principle that, you know, the, the solution with the fewest assumptions is probably the one you should have a look at that would indicate that, uh, maybe it's a physical issue and that's something that has a solution. So you want to make sure you check into that first. Um, if you do want more info about sleep, you can check out episode 180 of the podcast, just, uh, duffthesych.com slash episode 180. And I had a question from somebody recently about um, where you can where you can view episodes, older episodes. It's not only on the website. Um, you can find them on you know iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher, um, a lot of different places that you might find podcasts. Though many of them only hold the most recent 100 episodes. At least that's how Apple Podcasts is. I think that Spotify has older episodes, but if you're going back, you know, beyond 100 episodes ago, a lot of times the website is the best way to to find that. So yeah, uh, episode 180 is all about sleep. So if you're trying to get your sleep under control, I have lots of great tips for you there. And all of these, you know, none of these are going to be a a, a panacea that solves the whole problem, but these are going to give you steps in the right direction. And all the ones I've mentioned are basically free to do. So these are going to help you start to get your body under your control, which will uh, in turn have a positive influence over your emotional functioning. When it comes to depression, there are a couple major symptoms that are common and that it sounds like we're hearing in this case, which are uh, one, a lack of motivation, and then two, a a symptom that we call anhedonia. Anhedonia is basically, well, it literally translates to the inability to feel, and that's, that's what it is. You know, things that were once enjoyable or pleasurable for you fall flat. You may even find that the scale doesn't really tip in the other direction either. If you watch something that's really sad, you might just be like, hmm, okay, that's a thing. Not really feeling a lot of strong emotion in either direction. Basically just a state of blah, right? That's anhedonia, um, that just that cloud that's over you and you don't really feel anything. Uh, lack of motivation is another really big one. Uh, people tend to feel less inspiration to do activities and less physical energy overall. You can have, um, you know, slowness of movement that actually happens as a symptom of depression and then fatigue. You can feel actually physical, you know, muscle tiredness, sleepiness, things like that. And so it gets really hard to do activities and that reduction in activities in turn you know, increases your depression because you're doing less things. Maybe you feel bad about not doing as many things. And so you can fall into this vicious cycle that perhaps you find yourself in right now. The approach to dealing with this is uh, what we call behavioral activation. Um, So behavioral activation basically means trying to let the action come before the emotion. Um, A lot of times as humans, we, we wait to be in the right emotional state um, that we feel like we need to be in before jumping into an action. So there's a lot of examples here. This could be like uh, not feeling motivated to go to the gym, uh, you know, watching watching a movie that you want to watch, but not really feeling like you're in the right mood to watch that movie. 
writing, if you're a writer, feeling like you have to have the perfect inspiration and setting and, and feelings internally to start writing rather than just putting your hands on the keyboard and getting started. Um, it's also really common with sex. You know, a lot of times people feel like they have to be totally 100% in the mood first. And while that's always great when it happens, a lot of times uh, people don't really have that luxury. And sometimes they need to get started first and then the feeling catches up. So maybe they start with a little bit of foreplay and, you know, flirting and stuff like that. And once they kind of get the ball rolling, then the mood catches up. So that's the case for many different things in life. A lot of times, once you get started with the activity, the feeling does catch up. And so with behavioral activation, we're trying to kind of exploit that. And the other thing that we're doing is trying to train our brains to actually feel pleasure again, to feel happiness and joy. He talked about wanting to find joy in the little things again. That's what we're trying to do here. But you have to kind of retrain it because there are legitimate neurological changes that happen in terms of, you know, the way the neurotransmitters, the different messengers in your brain, um, there are differences in the way that works when you're significantly depressed. And so essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to tell your brain, hey, time to wake up, you know, time to wake up these, these receptors that help me feel good. They've been shut down for a while, but what you want to do is you kind of just keep coming by, keep force feeding it things that should be pleasurable. And in turn, you know, you get, you get dopamine and serotonin knocking on those receptor doors saying, Hey, I need you. Can you wake up? And eventually they will, eventually they'll start to light back up. There'll be receptors available for these, for these, you know, neurotransmitters that, that, that are floating around in your brain. And uh, you'll start to feel a little bit better. You'll start to have the capacity to feel better. So essentially with behavioral activation, what you want to do is uh, start finding activities that used to be happy or pleasurable for you. Or if you can't even remember or think of things, if you have no examples of things that were pleasurable previously or were happy for you, think about what you feel should be happy for you. You know, things that other people do that you wish you could feel happy with. And start with those. And what you're going to do is you're going to start doing them. You're going to start going through those activities, even though you don't feel like it. And this can be very hard to do. As I said, this is sort of a, it's the, the hard thing about depression. The reason it sticks around for a long time for, for a lot of people is that it's just so paradoxical. It's like, okay, that would be great. I would do that if I wasn't so depressed. So it takes a little bit of trickery sometimes. You need to sort of hack it and find your best ways to get started. But I think that one of the best things you can do is start by finding some easy wins, you know, things that you aren't already doing, that you sort of stopped doing, that have a mild level of challenge given your depression. Like it's, it takes a little bit of motivation. It's going to be a bit of a challenge, but also a high level of reward. And in my book, um, it's called Hardcore Self-Help Fuck Depression. Um, I actually have a worksheet in there that helps you sort of use a, a little bit of a formula to find which things might be those good starting point, easy win activities. So if you haven't yet, you, you might want to check that out. But either way, you know, you want to see where you can have a lot of bang for your buck, something that is, you know, a challenge, but not too much of a challenge. And then it gives you a lot of reward on the back end of that. So you're really trying to, um, again, wake up those receptors in your brain. And then from there, you just want to keep going. You want to basically develop a, a list of activities, and you can certainly get help with this. Maybe a friend, family member can help you brainstorm, even an online forum, people you talk to on social media, you know, just have them help you think of things that might be good ideas to start getting into. And then from there, you start treating it like a job. You know, this is your job. You want to work your way through this list. You can predict that you're not going to feel motivated. You can predict that it's going to feel dumb. Um, and it very well may seem silly and pointless, but that's exactly what depression wants you to think. Depression is like, it wants, it wants to keep itself safe, right? And so it's going to tell you that this is pointless. For some reason, over the past few months, I've been starting to think of depression as, uh, this is super nerdy, but if you're familiar with Spider-Man and Venom, Venom being the black, you know, gnarly looking uh, symbiote. He's a, basically a, an alien life form that latches onto somebody's body. And I think of depression that way. It just wants to keep itself safe. So you can imagine, you know, this, this Venom-like, you know, gross, sludgy depression speaking to you in your own mind saying, oh, don't do that. That's pointless, right? And so it wants you to think that this is pointless, that you're wasting time, that there's a legitimate, well thought, thought out, you know, reason that you feel so bad and that you should be hopeless. Um, but those are lies. Those are lies that depression tells you in order to keep itself safe and preserved. So try to ignore those, try to push forward. 
Um, it's normal to have a hard time getting started with this though. And one trick that you can use is what I call the five minute rule. And that's where it's very much what it sounds like. You commit to doing um, only five minutes of an activity. So you say, okay, I'm going to try this out and I'm going to give it five minutes of a shot. Um, if I don't like it, if I feel miserable, if I really hate it, I can quit after five minutes, but I at least have to give it five minutes of a try, um, which is great because, you know, you can really withstand many, many things for just five minutes. You know, you could probably stand on hot coals for five minutes if you wanted to. Actually, I don't know if that's true or not. Don't quote me on that, but you can endure a lot of things for five minutes. Uh, but what you find often is that once you get started, once you put that five minutes in, another five minutes isn't that bad. And then it just keeps rolling and the motivation kind of starts to magically appear once you actually start doing the activity. So, you know, use that five minute rule if you need to, to get started. And again, anything that it takes, you might need to borrow some motivation or accountability from other people. I know that for many, making plans with somebody else or asking them to help keep them accountable, to nag them a little bit helps to just get your butt moving because, you know, um, you don't want to let other people down. Uh, and ideally, in the end, you don't want to have to rely on things like shame or guilt to keep you motivated. But at this point, when you're just trying to get out the door, you're just trying to get involved in some of these activities, you're going to want to kind of take what you can get. Also, look out for your influences. Um, if you're trying to find the motivation to go for a nice long walk today, it's probably going to benefit you a whole lot more to maybe listen to an inspiring podcast or watch an uplifting YouTube video or listen to something that really pumps you up rather than like listening to your sad, all the feels rainy day playlist all the way up until you try to leave, right? One of those is going to get you to be, you know, subtly getting closer to the mood to go for a walk and, and do something for yourself. The other one is just going to make you feel sad, right? Um, what What is satisfying is not always what's healthy for you. And while it may feel very good to just, you know, get dark and, and, and feel those feelings and, and all of that, um, that's not going to help you do what you want to do here. So just be aware of that. There's nothing wrong with listening to sad songs, but there's a time and place for it. And um, there's also a good chance that you've probably fallen into some negative self-defeating thinking patterns as well. There's a lot of common ones in depression. Uh, one of the most common is what we call mental filter. So this is a, you can call it a cognitive distortion or a thinking trap is what I tend to call them. Um, but yeah, in my book, I call this one uh, shit color glasses because it's like you're wearing these really nasty brown glasses and everything you look through, everything you see when you look through those glasses has a gross brown tinge to it. It kind of looks shitty and that's due to your depression. So everything has this haze over it. And what that causes you to do is filter out all the positive or even neutral aspects of a situation and instead give a lot of credit only to the things that support the negative way that you already feel about yourself, right? So um, it, it convinces you that all the signs lead to depression. All the evidence there leads to, yeah, you're a screw up. You're not worth it. Um, there's no point in you trying. You can do as many things as you want, but nothing's going to make a difference. But that's the depression filtering out all those other things that say, yeah, maybe that's not the case. Um Personalization is another big one, you know, so feeling like things that happen are because of you. Um, also mind reading, feeling like you understand the reasons, the motivations behind other people's actions, you know, oh, they're doing that because they're mad at me or they're doing that because I let them down. And then of course, all or nothing thinking, you know, sort of just black and white thinking, not, not even thinking about all the nuance to a situation, but just like, yep, I'm, I'm bad. I'm a failure. I'm a terrible friend rather than like, I'm a good person. I maybe dropped the ball in this one. There's some room for interpretation here, all those different shades of gray. No, it's just very pol polarized one or the other. Um, if you want more information about that, just go to my website and search for common thinking traps. There's a podcast episode about it. And I also have a free printable that you can download um, that will help you get started with, with, you know, recognizing those and combating them. And you can work on, you know, combating those in a number of ways. Uh, sometimes simply making a conscious effort to learn about what your common thinking traps are and then start to look out for them can be a big help. Um, but then if you want more in-depth sort of uh, hand-holding, you can use something like an ABC thought log where you go through in a more structured way to address those thoughts and find other ways of thinking about the situation. Uh, you could also start trying to intentionally bring in more good influences, start learning more about depression, start learning more about different coping strategies. There are so many great free and affordable resources out there, uh, everything from books to courses to other podcasts, YouTube videos. 
Uh, one interesting book that uh, a patient of mine recently said really resonated with them is a book called Positive Intelligence. The author is uh, Shirzad Shamin, and uh, it's it's a little bit more like kind of productivity businessy, but I think that it, it presents a lot of fundamental psychology principles and a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here in a way that's fresh, and the metaphors that he uses seem to stick with people really well. So that's one you might check out if you're if you're looking for something else to try. Um, but yeah, you know, bringing in more positive influences, bringing in more information, that's only going to be helpful. Sometimes you may know, um, the information, but you just need to hear it in a slightly different way for it to really stick. And then if there's a productivity part of this, you know, if there's productivity element to your struggles that you're going through, that could also be addressed, you know, maybe that you need to work on um, how you're approaching your to-do lists. Uh, Maybe there are some huge tasks or even not huge ones that you're just putting off. So maybe you need to break them into smaller steps or really just sort of reward yourself for, you know, taking steps in the right direction uh, so that you stop feeling so guilty about the things that you're putting off. But, you know, that's, that's legitimate. Sometimes these things are uh, big influences on the way that we feel in our mood and our depression. So absolutely, if that's something that needs to be addressed, you you go ahead and do that. And then, um, you know, there's lifestyle changes. If you're surrounding yourself with people that are negatively impacting your mood, that are draining you, um, if you're in a job that's unfair and abusive and takes advantage of you, um, that, that should understandably make you feel bad. These are all legitimate things that you might want to do something about, right? It's, it's going to be hard to make a big positive change if the environment that you're in or the people you're around are constantly draining you back to a negative baseline. Um, what I'll say is that if motivation um, is hard to come by, which it probably is here, I would look out for things that you can do to sort of set yourself up for success. Um, so when you're feeling your least shitty, <laughs> you may always feel a bit bad, but when you're feeling the least bad, uh, maybe there are things you can do to set your future self up for success. You know, for instance, uh, you know, one that really helps me out is if I have the energy to do so, setting the coffee maker on a timer the night before so that when I wake up, I'm like, you know, oh God, it's so early, dreading getting out of bed. I got so much to do, but at least there's already the smell of fresh coffee. At least I can go there and bam, get some coffee in my system right away. Um, other things might be similar, you know, sort of just taking the time to outline your next day before you go to bed, thinking about what clothes you want to wear, um, thinking about if there's anything that you want to make sure that you remember, all those sorts of things, you know, that can come at the end of the day or really at any point, but doing it when you're not under pressure, when you're not already struggling with dysphoric feelings from having just woken up, things like that. And of course, there are professional avenues here, therapy, medication, you know about those, and there's no shame in using those if that would be helpful to you. Um, And those are kind of my thoughts. I think that you can absolutely make a dent in this. You can make a difference for yourself. You don't have to do everything all at once. I just wanted to give you lots of different ideas to, to play with. Um, But tackle things one at a time and build as you go. Start to build this positive snowball effect by just starting with one thing or two things and going from there. And remember, you're not doing anything wrong right now. You're not doing anything wrong by struggling. Uh, Obviously, you'd rather feel better, which is why you're writing into this podcast. But you also didn't ask to feel this way. You know, if you had the choice to not feel this way, you would snap your fingers and make that happen. So you're doing the responsible thing by trying to try, right? Trying to want this. And I think that you can do it. So thank you for writing in that question. I really appreciate it. Good stuff there. And with that, that is the end of the episode. This has been episode 264 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. Uh, If you want to send me a question, please shoot it to duffthepsych at gmail.com or go to duffthepsych.com and use the contact form there. And full show notes are also on the website as well. So thank you guys very, very much for listening. I appreciate your attention and all of your great questions. Hopefully your week has been good and I'll see you for the next one. Bye.